At the moment, the Flamingo missile is flying too high, between 50 and 100 meters, being picked up by Russian air defenses and shot down. Whereas with this contour matching, they're aiming to hopefully fly at 30 meters above the ground. And you really need this because if you don't have this contour matching, then you end up flying into a mountain or into an apartment block. And Ukrainians care about civilian lives and they don't want that to happen. So it really is an essential piece of tech which is missing from the Ukrainian missile systems, but is present in the Storm Shadows and the Tomahawk cruise missiles. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Future of War, Times Radio Tech's series on the technologies shaping the future of conflict and security globally. We're joined again by Richard Woodruff, founder of Frontline Kit, who works on both the technological and sometimes literal front line of military innovation, manufacturing drones and related technologies with the Ukrainian military. Richard, thanks again for joining us. Dobre večer. Well, it's great to see you again, Richard. Uh, we should talk this time about... Uh, some of the missile innovations that are coming out of this conflict, because the, the missile, while the drone has been important, the missile has very much dominated the air war as well, especially when it comes to, to long range strikes and Russia's use of these things. Uh, but Ukraine is now developing its own fleet of domestically made missiles, most famously the Flamingo. What can you tell us about this weapon system? The Flamingo is, is frankly fantastic. And I, I love the name that was actually given to it because one of the early variants that they uh, manufactured when it came out of the, the paint shop, um, the paint actually turned pink on the missile due to some manufacturing defect. So they decided to uh, aptly name it the Flamingo missile. Um, it's one of the largest missiles in the arsenal. Uh, it's just slightly shy of the size of a London double-decker bus. So you can imagine quite long, uh, 12 to 14 meters uh, the size of these things and the weight is absolutely huge on takeoff is about 6,000 kilograms including the fuel and the payload and everything else um, and these rockets can travel 3,000 kilometers and this is by far further than anything else that Ukraine has produced and is finally enabling uh, Ukraine to do these long deep range strikes that the Americans have banned us from using their technology to do and what that has opened up, it, it has opened up all of these uh, incredible like uh, oil refineries and uh, Russian air bases and military bases that were so deep in the rear previously um, that we couldn't hit. Now they are all targets. Um, so, yeah, the Flamingo missile, incredible piece of Ukrainian made technology, um, which will be hitting the battlefield very soon. And, and how does this missile stack up compared to, to Western missiles that are in Ukraine? What are the differences between this and something like a Storm Shadow or a Tomahawk? It's a lot, a lot cheaper being Ukrainian made. Um, we don't have to pay for these uh, Western uh, missile manufacturers or Western uh, weapons companies to put their, you know, thousand times mark up on it. Um, Ukraine is fighting for its survival, so therefore it's doing everything at the lowest possible cost. Um, it's very similar to the Western missiles, except this Flamingo missile has such a huge payload, whereas the Western missiles have quite a quite a smaller smaller payload. But the one thing it really, really is missing, which means that it's not the same as the Western ones, uh, is terrain contour matching. Um, and very simply, that means uh, that the missile itself can see in real time uh, where it's flying over and adjust its position where the Ukrainian variant doesn't have that. It costs a lot more money, and that is why it has been left out of these missiles. Um, but it is something that Ukraine will have to develop and it will have to implement inside of these missiles to make them really effective. Because at the moment, the Flamingo missile is flying too high, between 50 and 100 meters, being picked up by Russian air defenses and shot down. Whereas with this contour matching, they're aiming to hopefully fly at 30 meters above the ground and you really need this because if you don't have this contour matching, then you end up flying into a mountain or into an apartment block. And Ukrainians care about civilian lives and they don't want that to happen. So it really is an essential piece of tech which is missing from the Ukrainian missile systems, but is present in the Storm Shadows and the Tomahawk cruise missiles.
And of course, Ukraine does have access to the Storm Shadow system and its French counterpart. It's effectively the same missile. Um, what sort of role do those play at the moment in the Ukrainian military? How are they used and what are the kind of advantages? Uh, they're completely essential and they've been used very, very strategically because they are about a million bucks of missile. Uh, so very, very expensive missile systems. And the way the Ukrainians have been using them is when we are sending our drone storms into uh, Russia to target these oil refineries and weapons depots, um, they would go in initially to suppress all of the air defense. And then whilst that air defense is being suppressed because they're distracted by these cheaper drones, these $30,000 drones or these Luthi drones, um, that is when we'd send in the storm shadows that would take out the really key equipment when all the air defense is uh, suppressed or overloaded by the um, by the cheaper Ukrainian drones. And then, yeah, we, we send in the big boy storm shadows, the bunker busters um, to take out the real key pieces of uh, Russian technology. Yeah, and, and that's interesting, isn't it, the way that drones and missiles work together? I mean, how much have drones come to really complement missile attacks, not just Ukrainian ones, but also, unfortunately, Russian ones as well. Yeah, I mean, this always comes back down to being a cost war. And whoever's going to win it is the one that can do war the cheapest. Um, Ukraine is obviously struggling. You know, we need to think about every single dollar that we send into Russia uh, as effectively as possible. And that is why we are doing exactly the same as the Russians are doing and uh, sending as many drones as possible um, half, you know, as decoys just to really show us where all of these air defense systems are. Um, unfortunately, for air defense systems, when they are trying to locate our drones, they have to ping out radar signals. And the second they reveal their locations, we can send something like a storm shadow in to take out that air defense system. The second that air defense system's out, then we can send more missiles behind it over that pocket which has been created to then destroy the really vital bit of Russian technology that is being protected by these air defense systems. So um, the drones are really used as a suppression device and to overwhelm air defense systems, um, as well as their cells being able to target key pieces of uh, Russian oil refineries. We've seen this uh, time and time again, how they've intentionally struck very key bits of Russian oil refineries, which makes it very hard to repair and you know can give them downtime for many, many months. And what can you tell us about the fleet of missiles Russia has been using to strike Ukraine? Uh, there are things like the Kinzhal missile, aren't there, that, that, are, that are quite frequently used, but then also some of Russia's ICBMs as well. Why would they be dipping into their ICBM fleets? Very simply, they're running out of missiles and the missiles that they have been producing use a lot of Western technology, uh, which is very hard to get your hands a hold of. They have been since the beginning of the war, but now it's getting harder and harder. So what they're doing is they're taking old Russian stockpiles. They have thousands of these ICBMs that usually carry nuclear warheads. They're taking out the nuclear warheads. They're putting in a standard explosive and a little bit of extra fuel and then firing these onto Ukrainian territory. Um, and yeah, the only reason they are doing it is because they have so many of these missiles around already made, sat there waiting. And they're thinking, hey, what's the cheapest and easiest way to cause a bit of terror? Uh, let's send one of our ICBMs into, you know, the centre of Kyiv or uh, another major uh, capital in Ukraine. And we've also seen de Russia developing uh, new missiles which haven't been used in, in the war in Ukraine and perhaps might never be used. Things like the Skyfall uh, missile, which is a, a Russian nuclear powered missile. Um, what can you tell us about this missile and its pretty unusual way of, of powering itself? Yeah, it, it's, it's frankly terrifying. Um, the Skyfall missile, quite hilariously named by NATO that, um, it does have its own uh, Russian name, but it, it was uh, abbreviated to uh, Skyfall um, because of the fact that it kept falling from the sky, believe it or not. Uh, during their missile tests, uh, it kept falling and uh, the, the, the NATO guys thought it would be quite funny to name it Skyfall. Um, as you said, it was powered by a nuclear reactor. Um, very, very simply or very, very complicated, uh, that heats up the air incredibly, incredibly hot and pushes it through the uh, turbines 
on on the missile and yeah it gives it a unlimited range until uh, the reaction itself degrades the internal components which will happen before it actually runs out of uh, fuel itself um, it's terrifying for the fact that it, it can fly uh, so far and evade all of the radar systems and air defense systems because it has unlimited fuel, it can go in whatever path that it wants. It can fly. I think uh, when I was looking at it, it can fly for uh, 17 hours or, or something crazy along those lines is what it was tested at already. Um, and yeah, it, it's Russia's new Marvel weapon. And uh, the reason it is terrifying the West so much is because of the nuclear waste that when these things hit, you know, even if it doesn't have a nuclear warhead inside of it, um, just the nuclear waste from the engine from this uh, reaction uh, is hazardous and, you know, will for, you know, thousands and thousands of years whilst it decays affect whatever it lands on. So a uh, terrifying weapon and uh, we're, we're not taking it as lightly as the NATO guys. And uh, just to, to finish, finish Richard, there's uh, been a lot of advance in the way that missiles are intercepted as well during this conflict, just because of the, the amount of missiles that are being fired on both sides. Um, how is this becoming a really big challenge for both Ukraine and Russia? It's, every system is just getting overwhelmed. And once again, it comes back to... Uh, back to the fact that we have drones suppressing the air defense before and allowing these missile systems through. Um, there haven't been too many advancements in, in how to intercept them, apart from the fact that uh, these Western systems that we have been provided, uh, Patriot system, for instance, uh, is smarter than it has ever been. The, uh, the technology, uh, the data that the Americans have received from our missiles actually intercepting all of these uh, Russian missiles, they have never had that information before because it hasn't happened. Whereas now we've managed to, Ukrainians have actually managed to fine tune uh, the Patriot systems to be so much more effective at intercepting these Russian missiles. And at the very beginning of the war, the interception rates were extremely low. And now we're talking about 90, 95% some nights um, on some of Russia's pride and joy, some of their most uh, uninterceptable missiles, their, their wonder weapons that can get through uh, supposedly any air defense. And yeah, thanks to, thanks to Ukraine, um, America is getting this information and technology to be able to stop any missiles that may come towards the United States and Europe in the future. So uh, huge developments in terms of data that they're, they're getting. Um, yeah, insane. Well, Richard, I, I think that's all we've got time for. But uh, Richard Woodruff, founder of Frontline Kit, thanks very much for joining us again on The Future of War. Dzień dobry, Slavo Ukraini.